You may know Fujifilm as a trusted leader in endoscopic equipment, but we have recently evolved to become a complete endoscopy partner from screening to treatment for all kinds of endoscopic procedures. The acquisition of the endotherapeutic device manufacturer Medwork, now Fujifilm Medwork, has significantly increased the width and depth of Fujifilm's portfolio across the endoscopy pathway. For procedures in the upper gastrointestinal tract, which includes the esophagus and the stomach, Fujifilm offers its latest series of gastroscopes. They have excellent image quality, including multi-light technologies which incorporate LCI and BLI imaging modalities and enhanced optical magnification for improved detection and characterization of abnormalities. Even during challenging times like the COVID-19 pandemic, Fujifilm is continuing to innovate, helping to ensure safe and efficient procedures. Unique solutions such as ultra-thin endoscopes to perform transnasal endoscopy help to reduce patient backlogs while maintaining an excellent image quality. With a vision to become a complete endoscopy partner from screening to treatment, Fujifilm now also offers a wide range of therapeutic devices and endoscopic ancillary devices which enable physicians and nurses to perform a wide variety of procedures utilizing Fujifilm's innovative technologies. Solutions for hepatopancreatic obiliary, such as ERCP procedures, are also redefined. From special endoscope features supporting guidewire-assisted cannulation, all the way to stone extractions and other challenging procedures. Small bowel procedures, such as enteroscopy, require specific equipment to reach deep into the small intestine. Fujifilm's proprietary enteroscopy solution utilizes a specialist endoscope with double balloon technology, the gold standard in performing enteroscopy. It enables the physician to reach deep into the small bowel to perform diagnostic or therapeutic enteroscopy, supported by Fujifilm's new therapeutic device portfolio. Fujifilm's expertise and continual innovation is reflected in its solutions for the lower GI tract, starting with the unique CADI system, supported by Fujifilm's deep learning AI technology Riley, which enables computer-aided detection and characterization of polyps in the colon. When detection and characterization is successful and CADI has identified a polyp, for example a neoplastic lesion, resection can be performed utilizing Fujifilm's endotherapeutic solutions. For more information, get in touch with us via our website, fujifilm-endoscopy.com forward slash contact. Fujifilm, value from innovation. Dear friends and colleagues, uh, welcome to uh, this Wednesday webinar, a Fujifilm ECG webinar uh, focused on uh, ERCP, one of the biggest challenges in our endoscopic practice. So as you see here, we have a, have, um, a panel of uh, three excellent speakers that are going to focus on uh, different steps of ERCP. First of all, uh, gaining access with cannulation, uh, stone management, and uh, uh, finally, um, plastic stenting. And when do we uh, use multiple plastic stenting? And this, uh, will, uh, we will have a, a panel discussion uh, after these three uh, uh, lectures with the video cases. So um, uh, you know that this is the, the fifth year that we do these webinars and uh, uh, we really appreciate your, uh, your interaction, your questions, so please uh, submit it through the Q&A box. We will tackle all your questions, or at least as much as we can, at the end of the, of the three lectures. So uh, we will start with our first speaker, Andrea Anderloni, from um, uh, uh, Instituto Clinico Humanitas in Milano, and he has some uh, really fabulous uh, videos on cannulation. Andrea, the, uh, the air and the screen are yours. Hi, Mariana. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to discuss with you about this uh, exciting uh, topic. You know, when we speak about ERCP, we have always to bear in mind that ERCP does not exist until you reach the deep biliary cannulation. So cannulation means everything. Without cannulation, we cannot put a stent, we cannot... Um, we draw a stone, we cannot do uh, anything. So cannulation is the main thing. And uh, usually you can cannulate using uh, your uh, techniques and you can achieve the biliary cannulation most of the time, more than 85% of the cases. But sometimes, and this happens probably more times that you think, 
cannulation could be difficult. And when you reach the difficult biliary cannulation, you have to uh, think how to get rid of this. I wanted just to highlight the very last published paper on gastrointestinal and endoscopy showing a systematic review and network meta-analysis done by Antonio Facciorusso and co-workers analyzing the different kind of alternative approach when you have difficult biliary cannulation. Basically, we have uh, three kind of uh, cannulation techniques that are the needle knife, pre-cut, the septotomy, that is the sphincterotomy from the pancreatic uh, side, or the double guide wire techniques. In this interesting uh, um, systematic review published this month on gastrointestinal endoscopy, uh, the authors realized that uh, both uh, transpancreatic sphincterotomy and needle knife uh, um, pre-cut techniques are effective and are very important in reducing the risk of post-ERCP pancreatitis. But let's go down and have some videos together. This is the first video. This could be one of uh, the most classical challenge in our cannulation. You go to the second part of the duodenum and you realize that there is a diverticulum. You know, until you do ERCP, you don't know how many diverticulum in the duodenum you can find. Here you can realize the different techniques in order to get inside with approach from the angle, the axis, and using the sphincterotome in order to give the axis to the guide wire. But even more important is how to do the sphincterotomy in this case. Here we are using a sphincterotome from MedWork, the access tome, uh, that has a part that is covered by plastic, and this allows us to work properly and in a safe manner. Look at this sphincterotomy. Moving gently the scope, we are reaching a deep sphincterotomy without cutting the fold, thanks to the uh, idea of having the uh, wire cut covered by plastic that allow you not to cut the fold. Look at this, it's very, very nice. And you can go deep and reach this uh, wide sphincterotomy. So this is one of the cases that could give you some problems for cannulation. But of course, you can have other problems. This is another case that we have done a few months ago in which you can clearly recognize a normal papilla with probably something behind. Probably this papilla has a stone behind that really uh, give me some problems in the cannulation. I try to do a lot of uh, techniques to reach the deep cannulation like moving my hands right, left, up and down, gently use the tip of the scope to reach, asking my nurse to bow the uh, sphincterotome in order to change the angle. Basically, when you are not able to cannulate, you need to change your approach if each time you try to go for uh, the cannulation with the guide wire. At uh, this point, I'm asking to uh, work in a, a single uh, situation. As you can see, we have swiped the, the guide wire, and I'm trying to reach the deep biliary cannulation on my own without success. So I need to switch to a more advanced technique, alternative to the classic one. And in this case, I decide to use the needle knife uh, tome in order to do the pre-cut. I always start with a superficial uh, cut in order to address the papilla. I always cut the mucosa and submucosa in order to expose better the uh, sphincter and to cut deeply 
in the right position because you have always to bear in mind that you can always go deep, but you can never come back. Here, with the single operator technique, I'm able to reach the deep biliary cannulation and to start with a nice and complete sphincterotomy that allow me to enter with uh, the, um, the dormia basket, the, the twist and catch, and to withdraw this beautiful stone. So to go over, this is another interesting case, uh, uh, Mariana. This is a case in which unintentionally I have cannulate the pancreatic duct. So after two unintentional pancreatic duct, the ESG guidelines told me that we are facing a difficult biliary cannulation. So I need to do something. And I decide here to do the septotomy. That means to cut the sphincter from the pancreatic sides going towards the biliary area. So going towards the uh, 11 o'clock uh, situation. And this is quite nice because as shown also by the meta-analysis that I uh, presented at the beginning, this is a quite safe maneuver that allow me to address even tiny papillas. When you do the needle knife, you are maybe more comfortable when you have a bulging papilla. But in this case, I choose this technique because I thought it was more effective and safer in comparison with the needle knife. And look at this. When I'm able to uh, cut enough sphincter and to expose also the bile duct, I am leaving a guide wire inside the pancreatic duct and with the double guide wire technique, I'm able to cannulate in a selective way the bile duct. Bear in mind that the bile duct is always uh, above. It's always at 12 o'clock, usually much more than you think. Here is the nice picture, X-ray, that shows also the axis of the bile duct and the deep biliary cannulation. So what happened when I find an impacted stone, like in this case, sorry, like in this case? This is the case that uh, I found with a stone impacted and the big bulgy papilla in which I didn't start with uh, the standard cannulation technique, but I decide to start directly with the needle knife. I, I did not wait until I uh, can call this difficult biliary cannulation because it's pretty much clear that uh, with uh, the standard technique would have been difficult. So I started the needle knife pre-cut. First of all, a superficial cut in order to expose the wall of the common bile duct. And after that, go directly for the bile duct cannulation. And look at this. This is the pressure inside this bile duct. So this is a sphincterotomy, basically, with a needle knife. But moreover, I can realize that the stone was impacted not only in the papilla of the biliary tract, but also in the pancreatic duct. And with this nice technique, I was able to throw it away. So last but not least, what happened in a case of altered anatomy? Uh, as in the previous clip by Fujifilm, we know that uh, uh, Fuji uh, can uh, give us uh, plenty of uh, scopes in order to be able to cope with different situations. This is a bill of two uh, patients in which I was able to cannulate the bile duct, but then I had to perform a sphincterotomy. So leaving the guide wire as a guide inside the bile duct with the needle knife, 
I started doing a cut. We cannot call this pre-cut because uh, pre-cut means pre. What does it mean pre-cut? means that you are doing the cut before reaching the deep biliary cannulation. In this case, I had the biliary, deep biliary cannulation, but I had also to cope with another an altered anatomy, and so with a different angle of the papilla. So, gently, I uh, started cutting the muscle, and I usually say that this seems like the ESD technique because you need to be very precise to cut the muscle and to go for a, a clear cut. See that? This is really something that uh, I, I really like because it helps us understanding the anatomy of the papilla. If you do not, the, do not, do not know the, the anatomy, it's very difficult that you can perform such a procedure. And with uh, the, the, the te this technique, we were able to reach not only a good uh, biliary cannulation, but also a good sphincterotomy that allow us to uh, remove and to withdraw uh, stones. I think this is another uh, nice video to understand better that difficult biliary cannulation could be related to many, many situation, anatomy of the patients, anatomy of the papilla, and that's it. So, Mariana, I hope to, uh, to be able to stay with the time. Uh, I think this is uh, finished, and uh, I let you and the colleagues go on. Thank you very much, Andrea. These fabulous videos, and uh, uh, we were going to have a, a lot of. I already have a lot of questions for you, <laughs> but it's going to be the end of the um, of our of our lecture. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Stefan Groth from uh, Gastrocentrum Irslanden in Zurich, and he's going to tackle uh, stones. Please, Stefan. Thank you very much, Mariana. Yeah, my name is Stefan Groth. I work here in Zurich. Before, I've been working in Hamburg University and I've learned endoscopy from Nipsa Hendra and Thomas Resch there. So the topic of today is gallstone management. And check, this is my competing interest. I don't have any competing interest. Let us get directly to the steps of stone removal. We just saw the exit of the papilla can be quite challenging, but Andrea got a good close look at it and it seemed pretty easy in there. So next step is always the uh, full angiography, the contrast filling to take a look what the situation is like, what the stone is, well, where the stone is located, which size it has. And afterwards, it should be the opening of the papilla, whether by sphincterotomy, as we just saw, or maybe just by sphincteroplasty, we'll get to that. Afterwards, it's a stone removal, which you could do by a balloon or by a basket. And it's getting a bit more tricky if you have difficult or large stones. And afterwards, uh, still a topic to discuss whether you should do a success control if you have a complete removal or if you don't. So these are the topics I want to concentrate on. One thing is also the sphincterotomy, which you just saw, and the sphincteroplasty. And let's get to that first. Is a sphincterotomy enough or is it the recommendation or should it be a sphincteroplasty or are they equally possible? Or should it be the combination of a sphincterotomy and a balloon donation? So let us take a look at the ESG guideline. They re recommend a sphincterotomy, and they already give the right advice. It should be appropriate in length, and it should be adjusted to the papilla size and the stone size. From Andrea's video, we just saw some nice examples, and uh, we can maybe discuss later on, or the next pictures I show you, how to do the, or how to set the lengths of the sphincterotomy. But anyway, this is the ESGE guideline, which recommends the sphincterotomy as a method of choice. A sphincteroplasty just alone as a single method is not recommended, but it can be a choice when you have patient with a curriculopathy where you don't want to do a sphincterotomy or in the patients with altered anatomy where you can't position the sphincterotome so nicely and you see it's only a small stone, so it could be opportunity to just do a, a sphincteroplasty with a balloon. 
<clears throat> and the combination of a sphincterotomy and the sphincteroplasty is a method of choice for difficult and large stones, which I will show you later. So first step, take a look back at the sphincterotomy, which we just saw nicely from Andrea. You should always think about the anatomy of the sphincter from the papilla and how it is located in the duodenum. And of course, every papilla is different. And so each time you need to have an impression where the sphincter could be located and how far you have to do or you can do the sphincterotomy. So taking a look here, you see that the lower sphincter is a part which we should cut at least for 70, 80, 90%. And when taking a look at the first papilla here, you could imagine the sphincter goes up till here and that could be the maximum length of our sphincterotomy. So maybe for a normal or small stone, do a sphincterotomy of 70, 80% of this sphincter lesion. So this is different papilla, maybe a bit comparable to the one you saw at Andreas cases. It is uh, largely bulked into the duodenum as it was a stone stuck in there. And for sure you can do a large sphincterotomy up here if needed. So you can see, you can cut this whole area which is totally located in the duodenum. And this papilla is very, very difficult. You see it's behind or below a fold. You have a rooftop on it. You can't even see the upper part of the sphincter muscle. And in this cases, you can try to lift the upper part or this fold to see the, uh, the papilla better. But I also quite often do it that I do a small or thin, uh, very short sphincterotomy and after, afterwards a balloon dilation because it's safer in that case. But of course, there's no clear recommendation for that. If you have an other technique or you can easily move the papilla downwards, then you can maybe do a cut too. So coming to stone removal, that's the next question. What kind of instrument do we use? Should we use a basket or should we use a balloon? And I think everybody has his own experience and from center to center, so uh, you've learned it from your boss and he has the experience to do it better with a balloon or he has the experience to do it more with a basket. And most, place, most places I've been, most people use baskets. And, uh, <clears throat> but of course, especially in the United States, I think the balloon is more favorite. So what is again the ESGE recommendation? <clears throat> they took a look and they said they're equally, whether you use a balloon or you use a, a basket, it shouldn't be a problem. Both are very successful in removing normal stones around 10, 11 millimeters. This is one of the larger studies. It's a nice one, it's called basketball study. Uh, they took 184 patients and put them in two groups, 91 with a balloon, 93 with a basket for stones below 11 millimeters. And they had an absolutely comparable success rate for both. So I think you can choose whatever instrument you like, and maybe it's the choice of the location of the papilla. For example, if you have a different or uh, difficult situation where the papilla is located at the rim of a diverticulum, and it's difficult to access, so it's maybe more easy to use a guide wire together with a balloon. And if it's easy to access, maybe the basket is more easy or very successful too. There's no different, uh, there's no study comparing the different baskets. I personally prefer the twist and catch, which we just saw. And I did a small film here. You can see nicely how it's rotating. And I think it has a very good ability to grasp also small stones. You close it slowly here, you see it's rotating around. And so it, from my opinion, is grasping better also the small stones in that position and it's always widely opened. <clears throat> so now the difficult part with difficult stones, that's getting more complicated. You saw it's easy with a balloon or with a basket in the small stones, but we have the opportunities to do a mechanical lithotripsy or a cholangioscopy with a laser or ESWL therapy in that cases. But when should we choose which method? And should we use them immediately? No, the ESGE guideline recommends first step should be if you have large stones to do a sphincterotomy, which is maybe not the largest one, a limited one, and combine it with a balloon dilation and the question is how large should this balloon dilation be? And this is pretty much up to your experience. It's recommended in the studies between 12 and 20 millimeters. I actually never did a balloon dilation with 20 millimeters. 
But of course, there could be some cases with a very dilated bile duct and a nicely visible papilla where you could do that. Uh, and if it's even necessary, if the stone is in that size. But I think from 12 to 50 millimeters could be a standard balloon dilation for uh, larger stones. One of the recommendations is to measure or try to guess how large the lower part of the common bile duct is and to adapt this balloon to that size so that you don't over dilate the common bile duct. So this is the first choice. First try it with a limited sphincterotomy and with a balloon dilation between 12 and 20 millimeters and then try to remove even these large stones before you go to another method. Second choice, or I call it option A, because it's not maybe second in line, is to do a mechanical lithotripsy to grasp the stone and to crush it. Yes, with an emergency lithotriptor, but of course, if you can even plan it or can still remove the basket, then you can also do it with through the scope uh, lithotripsy techniques. We'll get to that later again. And the option B is a cholangioscopy and getting more and more of use as more and more people have the cholangioscope. Um, to do a cholangoscopy, whether with a laser or with ESWL therapy in that case. So this is the study for the limited sphincterotomy and the balloon dilation. They took 150 patients with one or more CBD stones above 30 millimeters, so quite large stones, and puts it in two groups. One group just doing a sphincterotomy and the other one the combination of balloon dilation together with well, sphincterotomy, together with the balloon dilation. And here you see the stone clearance in the only sphincterotomy group was 74%, whereas 96% in the combination group. So you see a clear difference here. And the, just biological, the need for mechanical lithotripsy was much lower in the sphincterotomy and balloon dilation group. Complications were comparable in both groups, so it's not a higher risk to do the balloon dilation. And um, so it's quite a good technique to even remove larger stones. And sometimes you wonder how large the stone can be to remove it over the normal opening of the papilla after balloon dilation. For the mechanical lithotripsy, it's also a very effective and uh, method which is quite uh, known for everybody. Of course, you know, or you have to have some experience with it, but then it's a safe method. Here in this large study, they. Uh, checked for 304 patients with bile ductions, and they removed from successfully from 272 patients, and this is a success rate of almost 90 percent. And uh, yeah, well, I can't understand these numbers, but in 32 patients they went to surgery, so maybe it was still in a time when they weren't able to do the cholangoscopy in second step. And you see here the uh, the complication rate is quite low with typical cholangitis, develop pancreatitis, and some patients with delayed bleeding, which you also see in a normal sphincterotomy. No. Okay, and here, I think also this feared complication of a ruptured or trapped basket is getting less and less as we have the cholangoscopy, and you can do a emergency cholangoscopy with the ESWL therapy to remove the basket. So I think it was very fear complication earlier times when you had to even operate on these patients. But nowadays with the cholangoscope, it's quite easy then to remove the stone or you have the choice to fix it. This is about cholangoscopy and the laser lithotripsy or ESWL, EHL therapy inside. Um, <clears throat> Um, you can see here, these are quite a number of studies which were published and summing these results, you see over 700 patients treated with a very, very high clearance rate of 94%. So it's a very effective method to remove large stones from the common bile duct. This is very interesting for me and also, everybody of you knows you did a mechanical lithotripsy or a cholangoscopy and removed some large stones. And afterwards, patient went back on the ward and next day, uh, assistant came and said, hey, the liver enzymes in increasing again. So what should we do? You do an ultrasound and you still see some remnants in the bile duct. And I think in that case, it's, it's 
quite often that we have some small remnants left after mechanical lytotripsy or after cholangoscopy with EHL therapy. And so the question is whether we should do some checkup. Of course, we can easily do the cholangoscopy with a balloon to block it and do a cholangoscopy and do a just contrast filling. And in this study, they checked what they did is that they did in mechanical lithotripsy or an EHL therapy and afterwards did a balloon occlusion and filled the bile duct with contrast agent. And right afterwards, they checked once again with the cholangioscope whether there are still some remnants left. And you can see here they examined 108 patients and the clearance confirmed by balloon, uh, first by balloon occluded cholangiography and afterwards by a direct access to the papilla and the bile duct with an endoscope. And they saw in 26 patients, which are 24%, that there were residual stones left. So in the end, they concluded, especially in cases when you do a uh, mechanical lithotripsy or you fragment large stones, that you have a very high rate of left stones inside. So these are the things about stone removal, just very briefly. What about antibiotics? It's always a question, should we do antibiotics? Is it recommended? What do the guidelines say? The ESG re recommends uh, that you don't have to do any antibiotics, especially in simple cases where you have small stones, which you can, uh, which you can expect at the first attempt. And for all other settings, there are no clear recommendations. Of course, you have the patients which are coming to the emergency unit with a cholangitis. And in most cases, an antibiotic is already started. And there are some data that a cholangioscopy per se is a higher risk for cholangitis. And so you could, or you should consider whether you should do an antibiotic therapy or not. The other thing, just briefly about the gallbladder, should we remove it? It's a clear yes. ESG recommends the removal in between two weeks. What are the data for that? The big Copland library um, research with five huge trials, about 662 patients, comparing ESCP and sphincterotomy alone versus uh, cholecystectomy afterwards. They showed uh, 78 higher percent in mortality after the next years in patients who were not treated by uh, cholecystectomy. So there's a clear yes from these studies. And the other question is the timing. And there's a, one very nice study from Scandinavia which shows a much higher risk of conversion and complications the more you prolong the time between the ERCP and the cholecystectomy. And in this study, the conversion rate increased even every 24 hours, or almost every 24 hours. And uh, so the recommendation from this study was to do it as early as possible and do an early elective cholecystectomy. So, Shortly, the take home message from my side in a normal anatomy, a small or mid sized stone, just do a sphincterotomy, use basket or balloon, or if you're not quite sure, even use both. In large stones, you should use a limited sphincterotomy combined with balloon dilations between, I'll say, 10 and 12, 20 millimeters. And if there's no success, use what, whichever method you have available and you know how to do it. So it could be mechanical lithotropsy or it could be the cholangioscopy with lithotripsy. Antibiotics, yes, if cholangitis, consider when difficult stones, especially when you have to do an cholangioscopy. This is a difficult topic. If available and you're convenient with it, do a cholangioscopy for the clearance control, especially when you did a mechanical lithotripsy or a lithotripsy at all in the bile duct. And the cholecystectomy, there's a clear yes from that side and as soon as possible, which you have to discuss with your surgeons too. So thank you very much. And let's discuss, discuss a bit later. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan, for this excellent presentation with uh, the recommendations and of course, uh, uh, the great work you've done uh, bringing out all the, uh, this, this important literature. And so uh, there are a lot of questions coming up, but uh, we'll, we'll do this discussion later with all the panelists. So I'll, I'll present our, um, uh, our last speaker, which is Geoffroy van Birvliet uh, from the CHU de, de Nice, and he's going to uh, focus on multiple plastic stenting. Uh, please, uh, Geoffroy. 
Thank you, Mar Mariana. Hello, hello to everyone. Thank you for the SG for this this kind invitation, and thank you, Fuji, for to allow me to, to to speak with you and and to share some some experience. Um, well, uh, if we uh, uh, if we add to, uh, to 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 be simply theoretically. Um, we know that finally, at this date, the, the, the use of, uh, of plastic stand in, in case of, of benign biliary uh, structure is certainly uh, limited uh, now. Uh, why? Because when uh, you uh, have a, a very short uh, soak on this, uh, this slide, you can see that there is some advantages and uh, inconvenience. Uh, for the use of the plastic stent and uh, the fully covered uh, metallic stent in this indication. And uh, we know that for the plastic stent, uh, this kind of material uh, presents low cost and large uh, availability. But the problem with the plastic stent, you know, that it is uh, it induces a long uh, procedure with some more step and manipulation. And we know that you have to uh, to implement and to change and to introduce uh, uh, each uh, three or four months a uh, new stand with several session and sedation. Uh, the problem with the fully covered metallic stand it is uh, the cost and sometimes sometimes the loss of follow up. But uh, uh, the easy point is that you, it is a one step procedure, a very fast procedure and uh, you can uh, let in place the material uh, during one year uh, if, you, if you want. But uh, since the last uh, guideline from uh, the European guideline, uh, which were published you know, in 2017 or 14, uh, there is some uh, new publication and I try to uh, summarize this publication in this table. Uh, about five recent randomized uh, uh, controlled trials. The most famous was, one is certainly uh, the uh, published in JAMA uh, by, by, the, by Cote. Uh, most of the time it is a, a multi-site uh, randomized controlled trial and uh, the uh, results are rather concordant uh, about uh, the subject. Uh, the conclusion are that uh, plastic stand or metallic stand in benign structure uh, are similar uh, in regard of the efficacy, the safety, uh, even if you treat the patient during six or 12 months in any indication. And the difference it is about uh, uh, the number of sessions uh, you propose to the patient because there is fewer uh, URCP sessions with positive effects, especially on cost. Uh, with uh, the uh, metallic material you use. So uh, here I will, I want to show you uh, two uh, very simple technique that you know. The first technique on the left uh, side of uh, this uh, slide, it is the uh, plastic stand insertion. Here it was a plastic, uh, Kena plastic stand from Medwork. Uh, which is very simple. When you have introduced your guidewire in the bile duct, you just have to uh, introduce uh, the support catheter. And uh, when you got the support catheter in the bile duct, you just have to push uh, the uh, plastic stand, uh, which could be from different size. Here it was a eight centimeter uh, prothesis stand of 10 French. And the other technique, it is uh, the use of the metallic uh, fully covered uh, stand. And here it was a very interesting case of chronic pancreatitis. You can see that uh, the structure and use on the pancreatic uh, side, a very huge dilation of the main pancreatic duct. And we decided to retrieve the plastic stand, which was uh, previously uh, inserted uh, to obtain the clearance of uh, the duct using a basket uh, from the, the, uh, the pancreatic, the main pancreatic duct, and then to introduce a fully covered uh, metallic stent uh, 
in the, uh, the pancreatic duct and also to perform the same procedure on the, uh, the biliary uh, tract because uh, the structure was also present uh, on the other side with uh, uh, dilation. Here you can see the, the pancreatic juice uh, which come from the, from the main pancreatic duct after uh, we launch and we insert uh, the fully covered uh, metal extent in, the, in, the, in this duct. And uh, after that, we treat the bile duct and uh, we decide to insert again a fully covered uh, metallic stent in uh, the main biliary duct, as you can, uh, as you can see. And uh, in the, during the same procedure, we treat for one year the uh, pancreatic side and uh, the pain uh, which was uh, uh, presented by, by the patient and the cholestasis induced by the chronic pancreatitis uh, with the full, this, uh, this last stent inserted. So uh, let's uh, jump from, 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 from the, 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 video, the, last, the last video case, um, which was a, a, a young female uh, she presents uh, a very uh, atypical story of uh, uh, EGG4 related disease diagnosis uh, in 2020. Uh, she starts in his disease by John Ice with uh, acute pancreatitis, a terrible uh, story with uh, a very uh, active cholangitis. Uh, with sepsis, but uh, we, uh, we decide to treat it with a biliary drainage using a fully covered metal extent from um, May 2020 to 2021 uh, uh, with uh, uh, favorable evaluation during the follow-up uh, due in part of uh, uh, steroid therapy. Uh, unfortunately, she presents a recurrence of uh, uh, the symptoms uh, uh, one month, uh, for one month with angina and inflammatory syndrome, several episodes of peri infection. And uh, uh, it was uh, uh, difficult to introduce a new, we decided to introduce a new immunosuppressive treatment, but we decided to uh, uh, treat it by a multi uh, metallic uh, plastic, uh, sorry, uh, stand to wait for the uh, efficacy of the, this new uh, immunosuppressive treatment. So this is the video. You, uh, you, will, uh, you will see that we, I start with a US uh, uh, video because we perform uh, first a very uh, interesting uh, picture you can see of the uh, biliary duct which was uh, uh, dilated and uh, with some material inside, uh, certainly some sludge without any uh, uh, stone, but uh, certainly sludge. And you can see uh, finally a significant sinking of uh, the barrier uh, wall, which was present specifically uh, inside the uh, pancreatic part of the, the bile duct, of the main bile duct. You can see this beautiful picture of the uh, cholangitis, which were present and which explain the symptom of, of, of this patient. So we decide uh, after that to uh, uh, use a multi plastic stenting uh, method because, in this very specific case, uh, uh, we want to wait uh, for the efficacy of, uh, of the, the new uh, medical treatment and not. Uh, to use again a fully covered metal stent uh, because uh, the, the effect was uh, expected uh, to be uh, to be short. So we uh, first we use a, a simple catheter to introduce a, a, a guide wire. Here it was uh, performed first in opacification, uh, obviously. Uh, this opac opacification uh, show us. Uh, uh, a dilation of uh, the main bile duct and the, the, the structure was uh, uh, observed 
uh, in the, the lower part of the bile duct, especially uh, uh, front of the, the pancreas and the cholangitis, which was observed during the US. You can see, uh, you can see here on this picture. And uh, we first introduced a, a GPS uh, guide wire from Medwork uh, in the, the left lobe. And uh, immediately uh, we decided to put in parallel another uh, guide wire inside, inside the bile duct to prepare, uh, to be prepared to insert uh, uh, two, uh, then uh, uh, three uh, plastic stent inside uh, the common binder. So it was uh, very simple like this. After that, we uh, introduced first, and I, we can discuss about that uh, during discussion uh, eventually, but uh, uh, me, I prefer always to, to introduce the longer stand and the larger stand uh, first. And uh, I use for it a 10 French, a 10 French um, uh, stand. And uh, the, uh, the size of the, the stand could be different depending on the, on the structure and the position of the, the structure. But, but here I decided to use a 12 centimeters uh, uh, plastic stand. It was a 10 French one. And uh, then you can. Uh, uh, immediately insert the third uh, guide wire. You can see that uh, after introducing the first stand, I decide uh, to maintain uh, the second guide wire and to, uh, to, to introduce again another guide wire, the same, uh, the same one, to uh, maintain the access and to be sure that uh, the access will be uh, uh, control during all the procedure. Oh, come back. So, some technical difficulties, no worries. The, the third stand come. Yes, perfect. Okay, so maybe we 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 jump to the yes, we we switch to the to to the conclusion. Um, so I think finally, in some cases, uh, uh, multi plastic stain is your best friend when you when you have a long road to to, to do especially for patient and unfit for surgery, for example, or when you, you, you meet some adverse events with the, the metallic material, which could be a possibility. Um, in my experience, some patient with uh, anticoagulation and in emergency, when you have to, to, to drain the bile duct with no possibility for biliary sphincterotomy, and you know that the risk of acute pancreatitis is improved by the fully covered stent, Maybe in this case, the multi plastic stent um, is interesting. And uh, as, uh, as I show you with this, uh, with this last video, certainly that uh, atypical indication and need for a very long stenting uh, on the other wise or waiting for a medical uh, uh, therapy effect. Uh, the, the stenting, the plastic stenting is still, is still interesting. So uh, thank you for, for your, uh, your attention. So I think we, now we have to, to discuss, Mariana. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Geoffrey, Geoffrey, for these uh, very interesting cases. And so uh, we will uh, we can tackle the uh, the questions now. Um, I will start with Andrea. Uh, he already answered uh, many questions online, uh, but I would like to uh, to focus on some of the questions that I think they are very they're very important. One of them regarding uh, the landmarks of the of the of the, uh, the anatomical landmarks of the papilla. And this was also shown very nice by Stefan in his lecture. And uh, how much would you cut? <laughs> Mariana, very nice and intriguing question. Actually, this is uh, the basic of uh, sphincterotomy. How much 
do you have to cut and when to stop? If you are thinking about this, sometimes you are, it's too late. So it's very important to speak just now for this. First of all, we need to know pretty much why we are cutting the papilla. This is the first question. Why am I cutting the papilla? I can cut the papilla either for putting something inside or maybe to withdraw the stones, basically. So if you are facing a papilla in a pancreatic cancer where you should place a stent, the sphincterotomy could be also minimal just to help you introducing the stand. But if you have to cope with stones, especially big stones, the uh, sphincterotomy should be done in a complete way. Moreover, I want to stress another con concept that even if the stone is not so big, uh, when you start doing sphincterotomy, you are offering to the patients the risk of the sphincterotomy. So on the other end, you need to offer the best treatment. And if you do not cut completely the sphincter, you may get in trouble in the next few years with a fibrotic tissue of the papilla. So I want to stress on this and to ask to everyone to check at the end of every year, how many patients do you have to repeat the ERCP for this reason? Because if those patients are too many, it means that your sphincterotomy is not complete. So the problem is always to check for the muscular layer of the sphincterotome, of the sphincter, and to try to cut not only outside, because Mariana, we keep on speaking about the fold on the top of the papilla, but I'm really not interested about the fold on the top of the papilla unless you are not cutting also inside the papilla. So my suggestion sometimes is to go a little bit further with the tip of the scope in order to face the papilla from the uh, down, in order to expose better the muscular layer of the sphincter. Last but not least, I want to remember that in specific cases like the diverticulum that I show you, if you are not feeling confident, just cut a little bit to give the axis and then use the large balloon dilation. If you use the large balloon dilation, you do not have to care about the landmark of the papilla. You just have to care about the diameter of the bile duct. So I think, Marianne, this could be a good trick in order to overcome the risk of perforation. Thank you very much, Andres. It's a very clear answer and very good tips and tricks there. Uh, question for, uh, for Stefan uh, about stone therapy. Uh, would you uh, put uh, a temporary stenting uh, in the algorithm somewhere? Uh, yes, it is still in some of the algorithms. And of course, it's the option of choice if you don't get the stone out. I wouldn't do it planned. So I wouldn't go for an ESCP, seize a stone and say, okay, wait, we leave this for three months and place a stent. As we, well, most clinics now have the opportunity, of course, of mechanical lithotripsy and of the cholangioscopy. And I think uh, only option would be if you don't have any time or the patient is instable to place a stent. And of course, uh, we wonder sometimes we place a stent see the patient four, six weeks later, and then it's quite easy to remove the stone. So of course it's a possibility and it was done very often, but I wouldn't do it planned. Uh, do you uh, consider placing a plastic stent after removing the stones, after all stones have been removed, but if you don't know the timing of the cholecystectomy, just to give extra protection? <laughs> I try to avoid it, uh, but quite often is that if you think about it, you don't do it and suddenly you see the patient next week again. So I try to avoid it. And only some cases when I see the cholangitis or I see several stones in a typical size, which could just leave the gallbladder, then I place a stent. 
Yes, but it is a very interesting question mm -hmm. because uh, maybe it depends from the size of the cystic duct. Mm. And sometimes when we have a, a very short and large cystic duct, maybe it could be interesting yeah. to, to I think, think about no, it. Uh, there is no answer. Uh, there's another interesting question that I think we don't have an answer yet is that if you have a patient that has an, uh, is, it doesn't have symptoms, we find that he has uh, a common uh, bile duct stone. Well, the recommendation is to extract it, but he also has gallstones. Would you also take out his gallbladder if he has no symptoms? The recommendation now is a clear yes, yeah. but I think it's not based on data as we no. don't have any, or there was never a study done on X patients who have no symptoms and you found the gallbladder and the bile duct stones and then check them up. So the recommendation is a yes, but I think it's not based on data. Uh, I have a question for, uh, for Geoffrey uh, about uh, stenting. So the fully covered stents and cholecystitis, real risk, real concern? Uh, I, uh, personally, I am not sure, but it is not based on, uh, on, on PubMed uh, analysis. Um, when, when you have a look on the, the randomized control studies, there is no, no very evident uh, difference when you treat with plastic or metallic stent. Uh, I think uh, the problem certainly is most important when you have a, a tumoral uh, cephalic lesion of the pancreas, because in this case, the cystic duct could be invaded by the, by the lesion. And in this case, when you put some covered metallic stent in some study, we found that there is a higher risk of cholecystasis. But I think that in, in, in benign structure without any, uh, uh, any um, contact or very uh, close contact with, uh, with, with the structure, I don't, I don't think that it is a problem for the fully uh, covered stent. I then have another uh, comment from uh, Stephen Seawald um, about the migration. Is this a common problem in your experience for the fully covered stents? Um, yes, I, I, I think so. in my in my experience, yes. But uh, uh, when you have a look again on the randomized control studies, there is no difference between both groups. But in my personal experience, when I, I, I meet uh, such adverse events in, in my patient, I switch for a plastic stenting. Yes, yes. Mm. And also Stefan uh, asks a chronic pancreatitis question is how long you're going to go until you offer surgery in this patient? This, we, will need, we will need another webinar for this question. Yes. <laughs> but uh, uh, quick answer, do you, do you still uh, send chronic pancreatitis patients to surgery? Um, uh, when, uh, if you look at the picture I show you uh, in my presentation with such such uh, uh, proximal structure with such uh, uh, beautiful deletion of the main pancreatic duct, no, I, I try to treat it with uh, with uh, with my uh, with my material and with my my um, motivation. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I I confess that. Uh, um, Today, uh, if, uh, we, if I show that after the three or six first months with a plastic 10 French stent, uh, the patient present um, uh, uh, some, some pain without any good result, uh, we, we switch rapidly for uh, surgical treatment, clearly, yes. And um, is uh, there any tics, tips and tricks to put in the, the multiple plastic stents without Migrate, having them migrate inside. Ah. <laughs> the RCP at five o'clock Friday afternoon, you're like, okay. <laughs> um, uh, difficult to have a, a good answer. I, I think that you have to, to put the most, the most uh, uh, higher number of stands that it is possible and not to 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 wait to answer three, four, or five stands. If it is possible uh, during the first session, you have to do that and not to wait because uh, uh, if you put only two stands, but it is a place to 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 put and to insert three or, or four, uh, it, it is a, a possible adverse event that you you have to expect it. So uh, in in 
the other possibility is to use uh, maybe a talon bone uh, uh, stand, which uh, uh, I show you that there is uh, a four flap uh, at the distal end, but it is totally empiric because there is no paper uh, which show uh, any, uh, any result uh, like this. It is only experience. Sometimes it should be very careful not to have the flap inside. Uh, yes. Uh, and also maybe change the diameter so you're not in full contact with the stent. Sometimes these are little tricks that can help. Um, Stefan, a uh, question about uh, stone management and extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. Do you still well, use no. it? Um, well, it's not available everywhere. It's only some places. But in Hamburg, we used it, but actually not for common bile duct stones. Mm. So always for intrahepatic stones. And I can just remember one or two very special cases where it wasn't possible. But nowadays, I think with the EHL therapy through the uh, hulangoscope, you always have a choice to remove the stones. So actually, there's a no, no use for that. Um, and you uh, nicely stated that it's very important to uh, offer cholecystectomy within two weeks, so early elective cholecystectomy for these patients. Uh, there were some questions about uh, ERCP combined with cholecystectomy preoperatively with uh, rendezvous. They do this a lot in, in, in Sweden. Uh, any experience on that? Uh, there's a lot of uh, experience. It's more or less organization. And yes. I think in most cases, we can't organize it like this. Also, we are very good organized in Switzerland, but uh, in one session, very difficult. Yeah, I think that really depends on the center. Huh? Uh, yeah. Actually, I think there's quite good data for surgeons who are used to do a hulangoscopy or uh, with contrast filling of the bile duct and even pushing the stones through. There's good data for the hulocystectomy through the surgeons and cleaning the bile duct, but most people didn't learn it and don't do it anymore. So it's always a question whether you have to do the ERCP first or the hulocystectomy yeah. first. Some questions, I think, depending very much on the experience of your surgeon. Um, Andrea, uh, can you give us some more tips and tricks about uh, uh, ERCP and altered anatomy? Huh. Uh, this is quite... Uh, this is another webinar. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> another two webinars, actually. <laughs> Nowadays, uh, altered anatomy is still, a, is still an issue. Uh, until a few years ago, we were thinking that, you know, we uh, were not going to have a beer or two anymore because it was uh, a previous uh, surgery in the past. But nowadays, also with uh, the bariatrics, we will face a lot of uh, altered anatomy patients. So we need to know exactly how to do. And I think uh, there are uh, different kinds of approach. First of all, you should know exactly what kind of uh, surgical intervention had the patient. I always ask uh, to have, you know, the contact of the surgeon in order to know exactly what the patient have done, because this could, could uh, help you in analyzing which is the best uh, solution. You can have uh, BRO2, you can have uh, RU&Y, you can have uh, a lot of uh, difficult uh, condition. For BRO2, I usually start with the frontal viewing gastroscope in order to understand which is the right uh, direction if the papilla is reachable. And if I manage, I prefer to use the frontal viewing gastroscope to, uh, to work. For the Roux and Y, I use uh, the colonoscope. I try to use a colonoscope with uh, a channel of uh, 3.8 in order to have the opportunity of using as much uh, um, devices as I can. And uh, we use now the um, underwater technique in which sense? We do not inflate and we use the filling of the water in order not to distend too much the small bowel. And we have shown also in a paper published in endoscopy last year that this could help you reaching the papilla uh, many times in a safe way and effective way. Uh, last but not least, we are living in the EUS uh, era. And I think that uh, having also 
this arrow could help you in choosing the best solution for that patient with that condition in that specific time. So knowing that there are different kinds of approach, having all the approach uh, ready for, uh, for that patient in that time. And uh, our last question for you, Andrea, is um, uh, are there any known uh, patient-related factors uh, that predict difficult cannulation, a difficult papilla, hmm. before you see the imaging? Just seeing the patient, BMI, age? Uh... Oh, well, uh, um, I saw this, uh, this question and they di I didn't answer because uh, I didn't know what to answer, <laughs> to be honest. But I think until you see the papilla, you cannot say anything because uh, the papilla is a matter of uh, position. And the position is not only the position of the patient on the back, on the left side, on, uh, on down, but also the position of uh, yourself and the position of the scope. I would ask to all of you to ask to a colleague to take some picture of you performing the ERCP, but not from the front, from the back. I always ask to my nurse to take some picture of me sometimes without telling. And you will be surprised on knowing how uh, many mistakes of the position of the shoulders and many other things you are doing. At least I'm still in this condition. So probably I would say that uh, the problem is not uh, usually of the patient, but also of uh, you, your instrument, your device, but mainly your techniques, to be honest. Thank you very much. And I'll finish with the last question on, um, on, st on strictures for Geoffroy uh, about um, um, PSC uh, st strictures, uh, about uh, dilation versus stenting for the dominant strictures in this, in this setting. What's your experience? Uh, I, I don't have a, a very mm -hmm. large experience, mm -hmm. I, I have to confess, but uh, um, as the last guideline and as the, ex the common experience of the big center said, uh, it is most, most important to, 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 to use the dilation in first uh, uh, intention and to, 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 to treat this kind of structure before to put some material because we know that uh, the barrier infection uh, are most common in this indication. So the dilation is the first technique you have to choose uh, when you have to treat this kind of, of patient. So um, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for uh, for this uh, these great lectures and videos and uh, the, the the fantastic panel discussion. Um, I think that we have to uh, close. Uh, it's already beyond uh, eight, but I think we could go on talking for another three hours. Uh, I would like to invite you all uh, to join us uh, in Prague for April for the days, uh, early bird registration deadline, 15th of March. So uh, we are doing a hybrid event, so you're cordially invited. We have a lot of, of uh, fantastic sessions going on there, hands-on. And so uh, please consider, uh, check the program out already on, on the website. And uh, uh, could, there's a, a lot of new benefits for ECG members. So uh, if you're not one, become a member. And uh, of course, you're invited next Wednesday again for another fantastic webinar on uh, the upper endoscopy uh, examination and tips and tricks. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, free to register there. And a big, big thanks to Fujifilm, uh, the ECG governing board, and our fabulous webinar te team, David and uh, Gabriela. So thank you all also for being here, for interacting with us and thank to our three fabulous panelists uh, and uh, see you soon. Thank, thank you. to you, Mariana. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Stay Bye. safe.